Welcome to the Proteomics course. Today I have a guest with me, uh, Professor Cynthia Goh. She is a professor in the Department of Chemistry at University of Toronto. She is also a director of Optical Sciences in University of Toronto. So we have been discussing about label-free uh, methods for uh, measurement of different type of biomolecular interactions, especially protein-protein interaction. And we have discussed different type of methods which are currently being used, including surface plasma resonance based uh, optical sensors. Now today with Dr. Cynthia Go, we will discuss about a diffraction based biosensors, which her lab is actively working on. And during discussion, she will also show some examples of how these type of diffraction based biosensors can be used for measurement of protein-protein interaction and it can also be applied for different type of diagnosis and point of care diagnostics. With that, I would like to welcome Professor Cynthia Go, and uh, we'll talk more on the how to measure protein interactions. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, um, as you know, biosensing is about the measurement of interactions between two biomolecules. And I'll be discussing uh, an unusual approach, uh, which actually is surprising that it hasn't been used before, but it was invented in my lab, which is to examine the interaction between two sets of molecules uh, using the principles of diffraction. So let me just take you back to uh, what you may remember from either your uh, basic physics course, or perhaps you may have met diffraction in the context of X-ray diffraction on crystals. Uh, if you look at the right-hand side there, I have two slits. Uh, if you've been watching waves uh, of water passing through two slits, you see that there's diffraction, these little wavelets that are formed, that results in an interference pattern that has light and dark spots. So um, in the middle part of this slide, uh, we see a beam of light passing through a grating, a diffraction grating, and it shows the main beam and a lot of little beams uh, that's generated. And the pattern of this diffraction image, the image of the diffraction, uh, depends on the pattern of, uh, grate, of the grating. So let me show how we can use diffraction, the principles of diffraction, to actually measure the interaction between molecules. So let me take a piece of glass slide here uh, and put a coating, just one molecular layer thick of coating that is in a pattern. So this is a grating, uh, lines made up of biomolecules that are uh, spaced uh, approximately a micron, a micron and a half apart, and such that when light is shined through that grating, which is very faint, there's going to be a little bit of diffraction, not much. In fact, you could barely see it in this, uh, in this cartoon drawing. Uh, however, if binding were to take place so that this molecule now has a complementary partner binding to it, so you can imagine this yellow one is protein one, the green one is protein two, what you see is that the grating becomes more pronounced, and so when light shines through that grating, you're going to get a much brighter spot. So again, let's just uh, do this in a different representation. I'll take you to a different slide where... So Cynthia, it okay? means uh, you are actually measuring how much material is there. And to begin with, if we have a small material, one nanometer size, and then if we are adding more material to it, then the change in the diffraction, uh, that is being measured. Right. That is correct. So effectively, we have a surface first, like a piece of glass where light will go through. And when there's, a, you know, just imagine writing with your pencil uh, lines on that piece of glass. If you shine light, you're going to get a diffraction. Except the lines that we're writing is one molecule thick, which is one protein layer thick. Right. And so the diffraction is very faint. So let me illustrate that in this little cartoon. So the sensor surface is a piece of glass. It has lines, as you can see in, uh, in this uh, uh, inset, and when I shine light through it, there's going to be a very faint signal. Now, supposing I introduce molecules that bind right on this line, uh, the signal gets darker, and it's represented in the right-hand side here by the intensity of light. So effectively, if I have a detector in one location, you can see that the signal increases with time as binding takes place. Now, if I were to introduce a second 
molecule that binds to that first one. Again, uh, the signal gets darker, so my detector then uh, creates a, uh, has an intensity increase with time. Uh, so good thing the multiplexing is possible in that way. Uh, we can talk about multiplexing in a different one. This one is basically, uh, the, this is one molecule binding to another molecule. molecule. You can also bind a second one. Sure. So you can imagine an antigen and an antibody and a secondary so anti antibody. You can also play games, if you're into trying to measure uh, relative strengths of interaction, you can imagine, uh, trying to imagine whether you can displace this antibody with another thing. So here's something coming in, another molecule, and if the binding is stronger, it may actually detach the previous one, right. and that will be indicated by a change in signal, in this case, a decrease in signal. So I think very similar to uh, what we had talked in the previous class on the surface plasma resonance methods. I think same way we have the baseline here, and we are measuring the time versus intensity on X and Y axis. That's and right. And then uh, we will have an on rate, we will have an off rate, that's Depending right. on the interaction, how it is strong or weak, one can actually compute the values for measuring the uh, on rate, off rate, and the kinetics of it. Th that's right. So it, it's very similar to surface plasma, and in fact, a lot of the principles are similar in that it, it depends on the index of refraction difference. Right. The main difference here is that in surface plasma, you only are looking at the main beam. In this case, because we are putting things in a pattern, then you're going to have a diffracted beam, and right. we're looking specifically at the diffracted beam. And there are advantages of doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, why, why would we actually want to measure uh, this way instead of just directly through surface plasma? Well, um, you can actually imagine in one area. If you're doing surface plasma, you can only put one molecule in that area. That's correct? Right. I think and also like now there are some newer methods where people are trying to have four plates or at least Th That's six. right. Now you have different areas different. and you can yeah. put things down in different areas. Right. So in the case of diffraction, uh, you note that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between what your grating looks like and what your diffraction image looks like. Right. So even just if I have a grating facing one way versus another way, I will have this grating will have dots in this direction, this grating will have dots in this direction. Okay. And therefore you can identify whether molecule A is binding to this one versus this one. Sure. So you can multiplex very easily, and that's one advantage. Um, uh, from the technical perspective, um, we can actually choose that kind of pattern to enhance the signal uh, right. and therefore create uh, a better sensor in many cases. Uh, but from um, if you we were trying to look into the diagnostic area in the future, one advantage of getting diffraction pattern is that if molecule B is not binding but just drops uh, somewhere accidentally, we call that non-specific binding. Right. In surface plasma, you will measure that because it attaches to the surface. Right. In a diffraction experiment, if you don't drop uh, in a linear or a grating pattern, right. then you won't get a signal. So it means like you are able to increase the specificity here and much more controlled manner as compared right. to what one can do and in you, yeah, and other methods. That's right. You can reduce what's called the false positive, false positive, where you get a signal that is not really meant to be a signal. Sure. I think that's a big advantage because when you are talking about diagnostics and you are looking at the very specific signal, that's right. I think giving a false signal can actually uh, be very for, for diagnostics, that's very important. But even for experiments in your lab, sure. you yep. of course do not Different. want to have you know big error bars because yes. some proteins just like falling out of your solution. Exactly. Okay. So uh, let me show you just uh, implementation-wise how simple this can be. Uh, as I said, this was um, this uh, technique was invented in my lab. And here's the example of substrate where we've patterned the biomolecules, uh, this protein on the piece of glass. And it's a submonolayer coverage. It's very small, a very sparse uh, amount of protein in there, and it's imperfect. As you can see, it's not even at all. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter because diffraction is defect tolerant. What do you mean by uh, defect tolerant? Because uh, if there is some defect, 
are we going to have different uh, type of diffraction pattern or that can be compensated because of the nature of diffraction? Yeah. Well, the nature of light is such that it will pick out the repeats that is of the order of its wavelength or higher. And so if you look at this picture, um, this is an atomic force microscope image. So each, uh, the little dots in there are proteins. And you can see that there's areas where there's sparse coverage and areas where there's more of them. And you can see a lot of clumps. Right. Uh, but as far as light is concerned, it doesn't matter because these clumps are non-repeating. And okay. if they're not periodic, it doesn't show up as a signal. Hmm. And so it ignores all this. You see, this is probably a protein that just, or maybe this is a piece of junk. And it ignores that completely. Okay, so I think uh, some error can be uh, tolerated in that way, the defects. That, that's into. right. And so from the point of view of building a device and building an instrument, it doesn't, it can, it doesn't have to cost much because you can you don't have to make things perfect. Yes. Making things perfect is very expensive. <laughs> yeah, but still at the end we can get the perfect signal. I think that's what matters. That's right. So again, let me just uh, show you in the different region. Uh, we have here the grating made up of individual protein molecules. Uh, and then uh, binding takes place on it, more binding takes place, and what happens is uh, here's the surface before binding. You can see that it, the coverage is not very strong. After binding, the coverage is strong, and you get a much uh, bigger signal, intensity yes, of signal. So you can quantify that. And here's an implementation of how simple it can be in our lab. Really, it has three components. The light source, which is, in this case, a laser pointer. It's a 3 milliwatt uh, red laser. And the detector here is, a, this is a CMOS detector, but uh, it could be a webcam. It could be a, what's called a photodiode, which is a very inexpensive uh, piece. And here is the sample cell, and let me uh, enhance that. So it seems like you have a prototype earlier to begin with. Well, this is how we built it in the lab, right? Sure. Because, uh, you know, you take pieces and put them together. Right. Uh, this is where the actual interaction takes place. And let me just do that schematically. So at the bottom here are two pieces of glass slide uh, separated by a double-sided tape. Uh, that makes a channel that's about a 50 microns. That's the thickness of the tape. And uh, on one of the glass slides, you put down the pattern of the proteins, and it's out here, so that you can then flow your analyte, your medium with the analyte in between. Right. And on the other side, we put in a prism. Uh, the prism helps to guide the light so that we're under what's called total internal reflection. So the light doesn't go all the way through, it just skims the surface and actually detects the binding on this upper substrate. So it's a very simple. So maybe you have a prism, then you have the matching fluid for refractive index correction. Then you got the slides which contain the protein. That's right. And then with the light beam, then you are initiating That's the right. refraction. Yeah. And with this simple, in, uh, this simple assembly, uh, you can actually measure down to nanograms per milliliter, uh, label free. Uh, so these other components in this uh, uh, setup are simply mirrors to make it a little bit more compact. Okay. And that's a very neat concept. And I think uh, then one can actually build various applications on it. That's right. So in, a, in our, as I said, in our first implementation, it's a diode uh, laser, a laser pointer, and a webcam. And these are actually pictures captured from the webcam mm -hmm. as you actually monitor the change in intensity on one spot of the diffraction image uh, upon addition of analyte. So after a few minutes, it gets darker, and then it gets darker even there. OK. The role of the prism uh, is to make sure that uh, the light beam doesn't actually get scattered by whatever is in solution. So here's a picture of what, what the diffraction spot would be if there were, be, if there were no prism, if it's not under total internal reflection. Uh, with total internal reflection, we get it a lot cleaner. And that means you can actually use a fluid like blood or something that's equivalently murky. So many times I think if the intention is to look for some biomarker or some sort of diagnostic, so measuring blood or serum becomes that's very right. important, right? Mm -hmm. And actually measuring that is very challenging because of the issues it's had. And that's where I think correction that, for right. uh, this type of scattering. Yes. But even in you know, doing your experiments, like if you're using cell lysate, for that's example, right. then uh, cell lysate has a lot of particles and it will actually scatter light. Definitely. So we have a lot of complex samples. It's not always the clean purified protein. That's right? Which right. one has to look for the direct mm -hmm. So in this case, you don't have to purify your sample before you actually do the experiment. That's right. Yeah. 
So, uh, and uh, if you have, we, we said before about multiple analytes. So in this case, you can have protein one in one direction and protein two as the other grating and you end up with two grating patterns and here's a webcam image of what it would look like. So this part here will be due to protein one, whereas this part uh, perpendicular, the spots perpendicular will be due to protein two. Okay. And so if you introduce your um, uh, medium, uh, if this spot lights up, you know there's binding to protein one. If this spot lights up, there's binding due to, uh, to protein two. Sure. So you can examine multiple analytes that way. So to show specificity, here's our example now. Now we have the names for the analytes. This is a mouse IgG on one analyte. The other one is a rabbit IgG. So when we introduce anti-mouse uh, IgG, you can see the increase in signal in one of the spots, but not in the other spot, the red versus the blue. And then uh, at this point, we introduce anti-rabbit IgG, in which case one of the spots, the second spot increased, but the first one just remained constant. So actually you will need to show the specificity of the assay, and I think to test it out, you have probably mobilized different type of proteins, That's including right. one from a rabbit, one from mouse. Yes. And now when you're looking at the how specific the signals are, then only anti-mouse is binding on the feature where we have the mouse IgG. That's correct. And the one where we have the anti-rabbit IgG, it's only binding with the That's right. rabbit IgG. That's right. And so, yes, yeah, so, and this is showing it with two. So now you can actually imagine generalizing it with more, right. and it only is a question of how many you want to pattern into that little substrate that Another you have. Another important point here is that you are able to measure the signal simultaneously for all the features. Right. So then actually you can compare those visibly while the experiments are going on. So mm -hmm. it just gives a little bit more room for even errors, right? One can actually correct for the errors. One can try to change the concentration of antibodies or different analytes, and one can have different room. I think that's one of the other major advantage of having yeah. the label-free systems where user can have the visible feel of the right. experiment, how it's progressing. Yeah, so label-free detection is how you would actually do it best if you're trying to measure kinetics, for example, right? right? Because you have right. the actual signal not uh, adulterated by a secondary mm -hmm. reaction. Yeah. Uh, but in, in this case, having multiple analytes is actually very good in, in building in controls, because you can imagine one of your spot is always a control. control. Uh, and in fact, we, we do that routinely in my lab when we're doing measurement. I think controls are very important. I think that's where it's good to have these features. So just to summarize the features and advantages, we actually talk about being able to detect more than one at a time simultaneously. Yeah. Of course, the question is, you know, why, is, why would you want that and how many uh, is a good number? And that really depends on what project you're, you're engaged in. But usually, like, based on your experience in the field, uh, for diagnostic purpose, what do you feel like what will be a good number in terms of how many one to measure simultaneously? Well, I think... Um, it's a question of cost now, right? The more, the more um, things you put down, the more expensive it becomes. So in, an, in any disease you're identifying, how many markers do you want? Or, uh, or if you want multiple diseases, how many of them are likely to occur at the same time? Mm -hmm. So I'd say it should be less than 10 because you know, chances are you're not going to be sick with ten, more than 10 That's different right. things. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a complex illness like, uh, like um, cardiovascular uh, diseases, um, probably there's four or five uh, relevant markers that one would like to detect. Right. Um, yes, one has to actually take a call like in terms of what they are actually trying to measure. Mm -hmm. And I think having as a uh, good marker is always good, but having too many is also not good because controlling them and actually keeping them functional for a long time. Again, all the that's cost right. for the measurement and everything comes that's in the picture. Right. Yeah, so I'd say somewhere between four and a dozen is probably what's that's a typical number. number. Sure. Yeah. So uh, the approach is also quantitative because, of course, the intensity of the signal is proportional to the amount of the material that's gone down. Uh, and it's, you know, of course, you have to run calibration curves to keep that standards going. Um, as we mentioned earlier, that there's little false positives because if things don't fall down on a grating, then it's just not going to be measured. Uh, and uh, that the information is real time. Again, that's, that's characteristic of all label-free techniques. It's a real time measurement of the actual interaction. Right. And therefore, you can extract from it kinetic information, binding uh, information. 
In our case, so, uh, the sample volume that's needed is very small. It's really, you know, it all, all depends on how, how good that little sample cell is. As I said, using double-sided uh, tape, we can get it down to 20 microliters. And that's like a small droplet. Right, I think that's very important, right? Because if you're talking about clinical sample and measuring the things in the clinical settings, I think it's very important how low we can go. That's right. But even in your experiments in the lab, yeah. right? Because <laughs> proteins are very expensive. Yes. So if you have the yes. smaller that is, the more experiments you Definitely. can do for cheap. Different. It's always better to do the, in the small volume, what is possible. Yeah. Now, the sensitivity, people ask me, how sensitive can this get? Well, um, if you notice that it's all about measuring that grating. So the, the more pronounced that grating, the bigger your signal. And therefore, uh, if you want to work with low concentration, it depends on how big your molecules are. The bigger the molecules, the better your signal is going to be. Right. Uh, but also the stronger the binding, the better your signal is going to be at low, uh, at low concentrations. Right. Um, so there's no direct answer to that, but in some sense it would be comparable to SPR because it's based on a similar yeah, principle, which is there's an index of refraction change at that, at that interface. Um, it's label free right now, um, but actually if you want to get a better sensitivity, you can also add labels. So you can actually start with uh, protein one or an antigen, you put in an antibody and that's your binding. If, you, if that signal is too weak, you could put in a secondary to identify your antibody. That's, I think very important because if you're not uh, able to detect the signal at very, very low level, then obviously you have to have some mechanism to that's bring the right. signal up. That's right. You can amplify. Or, or perhaps the other way of, of doing it too is that the signal may be low and you need an instrument, you need a, a good photodiode to do that, but then you want to sometimes amplify it so that it's now visible to your eye and then what you can do is you can add your secondary. Right. Okay, here I'll just show you an example. Here, here's an assay. Uh, th these are results from uh, an experiment in uh, this setup that I showed you earlier, that little prototype. Uh, so basically looking at the intensity of light as a function of time as we introduce anti-digoxin uh, to bind to a digoxin which has been immobilized uh, on the glass surface. Okay. So you can see that when the analyte, uh, when the anti-digoxin is 200 micrograms per mil, uh, you get the uppermost curve. Uh, as you decrease the analyte concentration, you get the lower and lower curves until down to 200 nanograms per mil. And here on the right hand side we blow it up so that you can see 200 ni nanograms per mil. Still pretty reasonable, I can still believe that still signal above noise but, but in there. The noise, yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, we can go from 200 micrograms per mil to 200 nanograms per mil label free in 20 microliters of solution in this experiment. Right. I think uh, that's quite good, but I think probably we can tweak it around to enhance well, the signal. So th this, is, uh, th this is still, of course, um, uh, okay, label free. this is label free. Right. It also is in that little uh, breadboard setup I showed you earlier, so uh, not, not optimized in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, some of these experiments we had done earlier just on a webcam with a manual capture of, of the intensity. Right. So uh, now uh, there's many ways of pushing it higher, but one way of doing so is by putting in a label. I know this is a label-free course, but, no, but uh, you can see what a label would do to you. So I think so, broadly we're discussing about different type of detection systems. I think it will fit. That's in, right. In that so you, you remember that we have a, a, a 200 nanograms per mil that I was in the previous slide. Right. But now I'm going to introduce a secondary. Here's a secondary antibody, and in this case, uh, labeled with a little piece of gold. Actually, we found out later we don't need that gold label. But anyway, uh, for this graph that was uh, had a gold label in there, and we can bring it down from 200 nanograms per mil to 2 nanograms per mil. That's and wonderful. now this is now the, the this um, noise is now the noise of the detector. So we're, uh, in order to go um, better than that, we have to do a little bit more of uh, signal averaging. Sure. Uh, and uh, we can do a different type of labeling, which is, this is a precipitation assay. So here's our initial antigen, and then you put in the antibody, the joxin, and then you put in um, the, anti, the secondary, which has uh, horseradish peroxidase in it. The horseradish peroxidase then acts on a substrate TMB to form a precipitate. Okay. If you do that, uh, we can actually go down to 50 picograms per mil. Okay. 
so much higher sensitivity. From two value. nanograms, here's two nanograms per mil here, and now two nanograms per mil is huge, right. and we go down to 50, 50. picograms per mil. Um, I think one can actually even tweak it further, but exactly. you're starting now to fight kinetics because uh, if you're very low, of course, you know, uh, th this binding is taking a very long period because it takes some time for them to find each other. So, but anyway, um, just in but this... this could be useful, I think, when we are talking about very weak protein-protein interactions or different type of analytes which are very, very low That's in right. abundance. So. Yeah. So that becomes now an issue about assay development. What right. we have here is a tool that allows you to measure the signal. Now, you can configure your assay so that you introduce... In this case, we were just introducing them linearly. Right. But in some cases, you can actually pre-mix a cocktail and then let it... Uh, and bind together, and right. that may sometimes work better. Sure. So uh, it's actually not just protein that we can actually uh, look for. These are some data on uh, troponin. Uh, this is still a protein antibody uh, assay. Um, the clinically relevant level is around here, above above this line, above two, okay. and you can see this is the signal. Uh, this is indicative of the noise of the system. That's why there's uh, you know, wiggles in that yeah. signal. But the interesting thing here is from the point of view of clinical diagnostics, that's 10 minutes here. Okay. So in less than five minutes, you already have a difference between uh, higher levels, clinically relevant levels, and clinically, uh, you know, absence of troponin. In a very short time, I think you're able to measure the that's signal right. with high intensity. That's right. So imagine that th this is a marker for, for cardiovascular disease, a marker for stroke, then you can know within a few minutes right. that it's there or not. Uh, here's an example for how you can actually assay for a couple of antibodies for, uh, for TB. Uh, here's looking at the 16 kilodalton. So there's, uh, we've sh we're just going to show you, in this case, an example of two markers, uh, two anti antibody antigen uh, binding for TB. Um, again, it's just looking at two different spots simultaneously happening, uh, and the introduction of um, antibody to the 16 kilodalton TB antigen. Again, you start with the experiment here, and so how do you correct for the baseline in the beginning? Because I see it's beginning okay. from 800 or something. Yeah. So there, there's a baseline. Oops, sorry about that. There's a baseline here because there is a diffraction pattern. We, we've put down the 16 kilo Dalton antigen uh, in, on the, the substrate. Surface, right. And so when you shine light on it, there's going to be a baseline. Right. Okay? And um, to actually reduce non-specific binding, we put in a BSA block. And so basically here, so that's, that's so that your, your uh, medium will not have all the proteins sticking to the lines. Sure. So you introduce a, a BSA block. So first you do the blocking of the surface the, and then... That's right. So the here, so the signal drops to zero because of the blocking, because the, uh, the BSA sticks in between the lines. Right. And then at this point, we introduce the 16 kilo Dalton... Uh, antibody for TB that will bind to the antigen. And you can see there's a little blip in here. Now, um, let me expand this area. You can see the expansion here. That blip is actually real because the that's signal right. to noise is good enough. Yeah. But in case you basically want something that's much more obvious or something that you can see, because at this point, when you have the precipitation, you can actually see the signal already. Okay. But yeah, we introduced the HRP goat antimouse and the TMB substrate here. And you can see the enhancement in signal. And so this is actually a very big intensity change. Uh, you can look at it. This is a 3,000. Right. Reading at 3,000, so it's a 3,000 uh, percent intensity change. Uh, no, that's, yeah. I think, uh, sort of clear yes or no answer, right? Th that's right. Yes, so if you're trying to create a diagnostic, just say yes or yes. no, well, here I can see, say yes or no. Right. Yeah, so that's one of the spots. Now, if you look at the second spot, which is, uh, which is filled with a 38 kilodalton TB antigen, uh, you can do the same experiment, uh, and then we'll put them together. Right, there's two two spots together. That's right. uh, at this point, we introduce the 16 kilo Dalton TB antibody, and one of the spots got more intense; the other one did not. Mm. And then at this point, we introduce the 38 kilo Dalton, and then you get the other spot got more intense. And yeah, then, then we we amplified them both in both spots. Now. The blue one is 16 KD, and the 38 KD mm -hmm. is the red one. And That's right. It is 
able to measure simultaneously both. That's right. That doesn't. And if yeah. we see the signal of both, then I think we know that person is actually positive for that. Well, we, we ha you have. Uh, well, TB is a very hard thing to detect, right. but at least now you know that you have two signs two that signs. it's there, yeah. and you can imagine adding because there's other types of uh, of potential markers for TB that we right. can just add to that, right. and so you get more and more sure that actually something is happening. It's more sort of I think proof of concept which you are showing, but I think it can be applicable depending That's on right. the context. Yeah. One can make the, make the assay more robust. That's with right. the introduction of right type of proteins and more markers. Yes. Well, now, the other way to do that also is now you can imagine making the second spot be a blank. Right. And that way you can make sure that the signal is, you know, in, in reference to a blank That's and, right. you know, that you don't have false, uh, false positives positive. in there. Okay. Uh, we can we can skip the other ones that other than proteins, but just to show you that you can measure, look at cells, you can look at polymers, because actually the measurement of interaction is you know is general. You can right. measure the interaction between two types of molecules. Okay, so I think now you got a prototype, and uh, probably you can discuss that how you took the prototype and actually took it at the commercial yeah. scale because. Ultimately, yeah. you need a lot of applications to develop. Right. Well, you know, I showed you what it looked like in my lab. So, uh, you know, and I can teach you how to make one of those. Uh, but unless you want to be an expert in optics, uh, then you don't really want to have to build one every time you do a measurement. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I could have just keep cranking out data, but that's not the point, right? We want to be able to create an instrument that will be useful to other people, and if we're going to go for medical diagnostics, it's important that the instrument is functional and, uh, and useful for others. And this is the role of commercialization. So at that point, I actually, uh, around um, January 2002 or so, basically, I decided that we have to commercialize the device in order to get it to be useful by others. And uh, this is important, uh, that thing that I believe in, that for science to be able to benefit society, it has to be turned into a product that mm -hmm. others can actually use. Uh, and so this is the path of an instrument. This is how it was in my lab. And up to now, we still have this, this instruments in my lab. We still work on the bench top. Uh, but what we did is we translated it into a series of steps so that the current device that went out in the market late 2006, early 2007, is an instrument that other people can use. And that little piece of double-sided sticky tape, you know, it's not really going to be good for you to just have to make that yourself. It's now a little piece of plastic that's actually a lot cheaper. It took a lot to get there, but it's now uh, much more efficient and cheaper. Okay, so here's the instrument. Um, it has, it's all computerized. There's pumping system inside. There's software. And it has the little sample cell that has eight spots in it that you can put down different, uh, different proteins or different snippets of DNA or whatever biomolecule you're uh, trying to assay. So now you are assay. providing the multiplexing capability for... Yes, it has multiplexing here. Uh, instead of on top of each other, it's now in eight different spots. And effectively in the instrument, the laser beam runs through back and forth. Okay. Uh, into this, and the, there's a channel there, um, there's an insertion port, the injection port where you inject the, uh, the analytes, right. uh, and it just goes to that little channel which is about 20 microliters or less. Yep. Okay, but it has a pumping system so you can actually control the flow rate and so on, which is, becomes important when you're doing kinetic studies. So here's an example of, um, of a study on the binding of a protein to a DNA. So in this case, this is the substrate. We put down streptavidin in a pattern, and we basically uh, take that, that substrate, and here's the initial signal from that substrate. What is the y-axis here? Are you related? This is a time uh, uh, versus uh, intensity. intensity. This is just uh, intensity in uh, arbitrary units at sure. this point. Yeah. Right? So. Uh, Rec A is a protein that binds to uh, to the um, to the DNA, and that's uh, what we wanted here to see is the kinetics of binding and unbinding. Right. Um, so we start with a substrate that has only streptavidin, and when you introduce Rec A to the to that uh, sample cell, nothing happens. Right. Rec A doesn't bind. So at this point here, we introduce uh, a biotinylated oligo. And so that binds to the streptavidin, and you get a little blip and signal. Right. Okay. When you introduce Rec at this point, you get a big Much increase in signal. signal. Right. 
Okay. And then we want to unbind RECA, so we introduce just the buffer to you know, flush out the RECA and the signal uh, goes down. That's because you know, the interaction between RECA and DNA is a lot weaker than yeah. antibody-antigen interaction. And you can repeat the experiment, etc. So, and you can actually analyze these curves to measure the binding and unbinding kinetics of RECA and DNA. So this will be similar to what we we're t talking about in SPR, right? Like in terms of on rate and off rate. That's right. I think similar. Yeah. So this is an on rate and off rate of Rec A onto DNA. Now, my, you know, similar both in here and in SPR, one has to actually uh, be um, put together the correct model in order to, to extract the correct uh, kinetics. Yeah. So I think the softwares play a role over there, like how you best fit the model and extract right. the data for. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I think, and I know that the SPR instruments come with, with associated software. Uh, now, uh, if you're actually trying to study a specific system, uh, it may or may not be the right uh, model for right. your system. Uh, in this case, you can actually write down the equations and do your own fitting of the data. So that's in order to extract real quantitative kinetics. So in this case, uh, as long as we're reasonably uh, at, at a certain range of concentration, the intensity is linear with concentration, and therefore you can actually model the kinetics nicely. Uh, it is, this is a similar experiment and this is on the binding of polymerase, uh, RNA polymerase, to the immobilized oligo. So it shows the kind of uh, different level of application one can achieve, not only as a strong antibody and uh, protein, mm -hmm. but also protein-protein or DNA protein. That's right. Or polymers or cells. Cells, yeah. So I think yeah. The cells are actually very easy because cells are big, right? right. So, right. you know, as long, in fact, the challenge with cells is we have to redesign the lines because they the move. lines, right, well, then let me, the, the lines originally we have are about 1.5 microns, okay. but, you know, cells are bigger than that, and so we have to redo the whole thing. With a much bigger uh, line. So different setting has to be. But out. but it's the same principle, and yes. in fact, it's actually uh, very simple to detect cells. Sure. Yeah. So uh, this is just um, again th this example is antibody immunoassay. So, so you can play games you know, on that. And what uh, you have on this one? So IDGs. yeah. So this one's yeah. So this is just antibody uh, antibody quantitation and showing a slightly different surface. This is avidin with a with a gum FC in there. Um, it's not different from the other one, so I'll pass by it. Sure. Here maybe is a more interesting example, and I think this uh, uh, this is one of the early clinical example uh, using now the instrument. As I said, now now the fact that there is an instrument that somebody else can use that means people can actually configure their assay and uh, play around with how you're going to get it to work best for measuring whatever it is you want to measure. That's okay? right. Uh, so this is the detection of neuron-specific enolase, which is basically associated with traumatic brain injury. And in this case, uh, so Dr. Is this kind of a marker which indicates the traumatic injury? That, that's correct, yes. And I'm not an expert on the, on the subject, <laughs> but uh, Dr. Berger was using this primarily to look at uh, markers in babies. When okay. you know, babies have shaken baby syndrome, they actually have issues about whether the baby has been shaken. Okay. And in this case, uh, being able to use only 20 microliters is very important because you cannot get too much blood from, from babies. Right. And so here's an example where they actually have a, um, you know, it's, it's effectively the same as we've been discussing okay. before. You, and you put down one protein that identifies another protein and sure enough it works. I mean, as a physical chemist, I feel like, well, if it works for one, <laughs> it has worked for, if it work for another. Yes. It's a question of how strong the signal is, which is dependent on how big the, the sample is. But the challenge here will be like in terms of the level of the protein, right? In the That's different correct. patients. Yeah, what, what is a significant level? So in designing uh, biodiagnostic instruments, one has to always ask, you know, if I'm detecting for disease X, what's the relevant concentration to right. detect? Right. And whether yeah. I'm able to capture the dynamic range. And That's right. Well, and, or whether it's even important to have dynamic range, okay? So if you're actually looking for a marker that's, uh, you know, present in micromolar quantities, that's not a challenge. You can right. use anything that you have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but also then there's no sense building an instrument that can go down to, to nanomolar if all you're detecting is micromolar. Yep. Now, for many, if, if you're interested is primarily in terms of kinetics, then uh, you don't really run kinetics at low concentration. And so, you know, you don't have to you do an instrument that can do nanomolar if you're trying to actually do kinetics, because usually you run that at micromolar. Yeah. 
So um, here's an example of uh, troponin detection. So the interesting thing here is being able to detect a complex system. So in this case, and this is the work of, uh, of Professor Jenny Van Eyck at Johns Hopkins, again using the instrument already, the commercial instrument, uh, in the surface you put down the antibody, the anti-troponin. Right. Uh, in this case, troponin is a complex that has three parts, and you can identify whether all three parts are present or in what amount are the three parts present by putting now an antibody for uh, each of the parts of troponin and measuring the response. So it's almost a multiplex assay, except for it's all on the same protein. Same protein. And uh, again, so at each point uh, here is the introduction of another thing. So uh, the introduction of the troponin and then the introduction of all the different antibodies to the different parts of it. Um, the, way they, the way we configure the instrument is actually in order to introduce a different um, solution, there's a little gas bubble, right. <laughs> and so this gas bubble marks where you introduce. It's a time zero. So if you're doing a kinetic measurement, you need to know exactly where time zero is, when things were introduced. I think in this case, since uh, I think they know the biology of it well, so probably uh, measuring different components was easy because I think they were able to generate entire CTNL and entire CNC That's right. TNC and TNT fragments and then specific antibodies for it. I think it's a pretty neat experiment where you mm -hmm. can actually measure the complex protein, but also right. its uh, individual uh, components. Yes. Yes. And so you're being able to do that and then configuring your assay because you can actually do displacements and take them away. Uh, right. Right. Um, just, and this can be done in, uh, how, how long is this? So this is... Um, 5,000 seconds, but it doesn't have to be even 5,000 seconds. If you're not doing kinetics, you can cut this thing shorter, right? right? So it doesn't have to be that long. The comparable technique is to actually do a Western blot, and you know how long Western <laughs> blots take. It will be whole yeah, and, and a lot of work and a lot of material. Right. So that's what's actually a very nice uh, way you can actually do experiments faster. Sure. Um, you know, there's various applications that different groups have studied, and this is about uh, detection in, in uh, PSA. And uh, some interesting work were done on antibodies uh, for isotyping and avidity experiments. So as I said, once the instrument is commercial, um, I don't even know what these things are anymore. It's I mean, just measuring interactions of different biomolecules, but, and one can use the same principle. Yeah, yeah well, you, you can use the same instrument, but now you can configure your assay, assay. to get you the number you want. Because, okay. for example, um, if I told you that um, we work best with large molecules. Well, how do you start doing small molecules? Well, you have to be more clever at it. You might have to do a displacement assay. Yeah. It's still, well, it's label free, but you're right. going to have to do a displacement to compare the strengths of interaction. Right. In this case, you know, to look at isotyping and avidity, it's about a displacement uh, that they're doing. Same for all technology, right? right. Th that's right. Yeah. But, but you see, uh, I personally couldn't have done all these wonderful applications. Sure. Uh, so again, I go back to, you know, the desire to benefit society by sharing your science. And it's not just about publishing it, but actually creating a device that facilitates other can, studies. Uh, give rise to multiple applications depending That's on right. what you And want. hopefully get it to be more useful quickly. I mean, if we can have diagnostics that are useful quickly, yes. that, that's great. Yeah. So, let me just show you how we actually did multiplex. I, I kind of glossed over. I said there are eight spots in there. But to put eight different proteins on a piece of glass slide is in a pattern yeah. is actually non-trivial. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can do it by physically doing them one by one, but that becomes very, very expensive, expensive and prone to errors. Yeah. So one approach that we've actually done together uh, with, with, uh, with uh, in collaboration with Axela, the company, is to use what's called the beckman coulter A squared linkers, which are short snippets of DNA that uh, they actually have created in order to bind to proteins, uh, but they're distinct enough so that each snippet is on one location. So for example, uh, when I bind this dark blue single-stranded oligo, to the protein, it will specifically bind to this site. Right. So it will hybridize at specific location. So it makes it a lot easier to, you know, you, you have to react your protein with this DNA, but that chemistry is known. And then you just inject them all and they go to the right locations. And so I think you can achieve more interaction simultaneously. And you can measure eight different eight things years. at the same time. 
and that's the whole idea. So, and the the instrument works, and hopefully uh, other people will start uh, developing more. Right now, there's um, the main people using it are in uh, the diagnostics uh, area, trying to actually develop uh, ways of detecting certain uh, illnesses, but uh, it can be used for research to actually look at uh, the binding kinetics. Yes, I think now, uh, since we have developed this device, so now one has to think like, where next, right? Where so what is, uh... Yeah, well, of course, the, the dream um, is point of care diagnostics for many, right? Basically, to be able to actually uh, get yourself diagnosed without, to have, to, without having to have, you know, lots and lots of vials of blood extracted, sent to the clinic, uh, sent to some uh, laboratory and to take medicine. So if you can have diagnostics in the doctor's office, you can know quickly. That, that's a dream. Uh, there's a lot of issues uh, in it, and it's not scientific. It's a question really of, of business and policy and so on, right? Uh, so that's, that's the goal for the company. So in, in terms of detection systems, uh, obviously you are looking at uh, diffraction based system here and you're aware like the optical based system and different type of other platforms are available how do you foresee the kind of uh, like the based on the user requirement how the field is going to progress in terms of one has to really rely on one type of only uh, principle and device based on it one need to have a combination of it or uh, depending on the type of samples one can select these type of things so what is like since you're working in this area from long time uh, what will be your perspective, like where the field is progressing and uh, what do you think, like is, is there a specific way one can just select a platform and move forward on it or depending on our kind of application one has to See no, I, I don't think there is one answer to everything because different different uh, devices have different strengths. Okay, so for example, what, what is the weakness for something like a diffractive optic? Uh, remember I told you there has to be repeats. Right. So therefore, we cannot detect one single molecule. Okay, so what is the best sensitivity you can achieve? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but it's certainly multiples of molecules. Right. So if you're trying to go very, very low numbers, that's not a, a way to go. Uh, so it works best. Uh, probably its main advantage is in a detection of multiplexing multi that needs multiplexing, particularly things that needs a wide dynamic range. Okay. So for example, if you're looking at cardiac markers, some are present at nanograms, some are present at micrograms, it's very hard to find a technique that will span a very wide dynamic range. Uh, but um, there are other uh, advantages of different techniques, and one has to consider um, also the ease of use, the cost, the time right. needed, uh, etc. Right? So, uh, if you're trying to do a early detection of cancer, you're willing to pay premium because it's you know very very important. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if you're uh, trying to do a surveillance of malaria, you're not willing to pay premium because right. after all, what are you going to do? Right? So, so there's a lot of considerations, not just technology. Technology yes. when you're looking at kind it. of application and yeah and this is why and I think sometimes um, when people talk about diagnostics they, they really don't think about the part path to market sure. and in fact different countries of the world or maybe even different towns within a country may have different uh, diagnostics that may suit them because of the local, local situation I think one has to actually customize their devices based on the need for the local uh, mm -hmm. market. And the and regulations locally, right. <laughs> and, and as well as the kind of illnesses that people may be having to address. Uh, so sometimes we scientists tend to concentrate on signal and sensitivity, <laughs> which I still put it down. We know we want to have better signal, higher sensitivity. We, of course, want more accurate diagnostics, but then again, you know, just how accurate do you need it? I mean, basically, you know, usually when it's when you're ninety percent chance of having a disease, probably you'll get treatment for the disease. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but from the basic science perspective, uh, we would like to understand kinetics a bit better. Uh, so that there, there are models, there are um, software where you can press a button and out pops an answer, and sometimes you have to ask, well, is that really what's happening? Because once you start to de to deal with confined media, very small volumes, uh, and uh, you, you start 
having other issues, especially if you're, there are other things in solution that you have to take into account. Do you foresee uh, your diffraction based lenses in terms of integrating it with more nano elements, some nanomaterial, or uh, with the plasmons, or integrating yeah. different uh, components for having the better applications? Well, that's it. so that's one, one uh, way of improving sensitivity. So right now we built this to be as cheap and as simple as possible. I told you there are three elements, a light source, a sample cell, and a detector. Right. The rest are, you know, things that you can remove, but it's there, not nice for research. Uh, if you want to increase the signal, then you can put in a plasmonic surface. Actually, there are two approaches that I'm working with, with colleagues. Uh, one is uh, using uh, plasmonics uh, by having gold either on the surface or as particles or on the lines. And the other one is to actually uh, do um, elements that are vertical. Okay. to actually have confined what's called black surface waves. Again, they will make the device more expensive because it's more complex, and probably because it's more complex, it's less robust. Uh, but if you can get two orders more sensitivity, then you have a chance of looking at early stage cancer. So there's all these pluses and minuses. That you have so I think the uh, application is to look for the very, very low abundant mo molecule at very early stage. I think that's the problem that, we need to have. Well, that's this what, integration. Uh, that's what everybody seems to be after. That's not what I'm, uh, my main interest is to actually look at it to re-engineer everything for low resource setting. Just how cheap can we get it so that we can actually do, say, dengue surveillance, right? Where you don't want to spend too much because really, again, what after all, what would you do if somebody's sick? Right. At the same time, you need to know whether there's going to be a, there's a breakout happening at the remote village. Yep. So that means I need to be able to do very low cost, a thousand sense of, of, uh, of experiments quickly in a device that's robust enough to probably be powered by the sun. Sure. So that's what I'm after. <laughs> so thank you very much, Cynthia. I think uh, as you uh, learned from her lecture, uh, the science part of it, how one has to think about the even simple uh, physics principle and then build devices from it, which can be applicable for various type of application. And also she is being an entrepreneur. Uh, she always had an insight of making the devices of the low cost, which can have the better implication for various type of uh, market. And that's where I think during our entire discussion you have been hearing, like not only in terms of making the device and its application, but also how well it can be applicable for the uh, different type of consumer, different type of people for different type of point of care detection devices. So I'd like to thank again uh, Cynthia for uh, sharing your work with us and giving us a very good insight about uh, different type of detection system, including the diffraction-based sensor and how one can uh, play with the different type of molecules over there and have either label-free or label-based detection for better sensitivity. Thank you very much. And thank you.